Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Ross Lockwood is taking us through the second part of the promise and perils of nanotechnology. I just wanted to briefly mention that we have now covered all five topics in the uh, collaboration with uh, Semmelweis University Medical School. But two of those uh, collaborations at present only have one person. Now that's fine, but it would be a little bit better if we had pairs for all five of them. So if any of you haven't uh, um, offered your services in this collaboration, or if you know somebody who uh, uh, hasn't and who would like to volunteer for topics three or four, those are the ones that currently only have a single person at our end. The class there in Budapest is only once a week, so it's only on Tuesdays. So the, the time when uh, Bertolin Metzko ha has the most interaction with the students is on Tuesday. Next Tuesday, He's going to ask the students whether one or more of them would like to Skype with us on the 25th. Um, and I think that would be interesting uh, on that day when Patrick uh, Polarski is giving his lecture to have one of them witness that lecture and also say hi to us and, you know, interact with us, basically take part in that uh, session. So, so that's the tentative plan that one of their students would join us on the 25th. So that's really all I had to tell you. So Ross, take it away. Sounds perfect. Okay, so just to preface the lecture today, uh, again, I'm doing this on behalf of Michael Woodside, who's away. And uh, if you want to supplement some of the things I'm saying today with his lecture from last year, it is available on YouTube. So uh, I'd like to just point you in that direction. And uh, just a warning, uh, when, we, when we first went through this lecture, um, some of the animations worked, and we didn't catch the ones that didn't work. So I'm going to try and do kind of a hack where uh, for, the working, for, the, for the animations that don't work, if I really want you to see them, we're going to go to Michael Woodside's original lecture and show you them from there rather than skip them entirely, because there's some really interesting stuff that he covers there. Um, I'm going to try a different strategy today, and I'm not going to use any notes, so I'm going to go straight off the slides, and I've actually gone through the builds this time, so I think that we can uh, do a better job. So this is uh, part two of the promise and perils of nanotechnology, and today we're going to be exploring some of the actual practical aspects of nanotechnology and what's actually being done today. Um, as you already know, this field is tremendous in size. It encompasses biology, physics, chemistry, engineering, and many other cross-disciplinary efforts now, uh, like optomechanics and um, optogenetics, and all sorts of fields that um, are a mishmash of the two. And some of the specific examples of nanotechnology that we'll be talking about today um, are building structures by manipulating individual atoms. Okay, so these are the quantum dots that we've previously talked about, and we'll look at atomic corrals, new ar architectures for computation, and then we'll use, uh, we'll explore biology as a template for nanotechnology. So, um, how do biomotors work? What's DNA origami? And what is synthetic biology? So to address that topic number one, we start uh, with a, a device that we explored uh, a few weeks ago called the scanning tunneling microscope. And here's a, a good image of what a scanning tunneling microscope is. So it's a little metal tip that's held by a piezoelectric uh, scanner. And what they do is they measure the current from the tip to the sample. And the closer and closer you get, um, eventually you get to the point where quantum mechanics takes over and you get something called a tunneling current. So this is where uh, we talked about uh, electrons actually doing a, a jump through the gap between the surface and the, and the tip and tunneling. And you can actually measure that tunneling current very accurately. So you set your tip to a particular voltage 
and you bring it down to the surface. And at one point before the, the tip actually hits the surface, electrons start to flow. And so you can tell then that you're, you're near the sur surface. And if you scan that tip along, it'll go over these little voltage bumps that represent where the atoms are. So you're actually imaging kind of the electrons uh, around the atoms rather than actually touching them. There is an atomic force microscopy which actually touches the surface and measures the force on the, on the surface. But STM, you, you never actually touch the surface with, with the tip of the microscope. And as you can see there, the tip of the microscope or the tip of the, um, the tip itself can have one atom at the end. So you're really doing atomic level imaging with this thing. Uh, one of the images that it produces, here's a silicon surface. So each of those bright clouds represents a silicon atom. And you can see that depending on how you've cleaved the surface, you can, you can see a well-defined crystalline structure. Um, you can push, you can use these tips again to push atoms around. So by applying different voltages, you can actually grab atoms and drag them uh, on a, on a surface. So here uh, is a, a study by Eigler at IBM where they actually spelled out IBM with these atoms. And uh, here's a little nanopudian uh, stick man that was drawn with atoms. But you aren't just restricted to drawing things on a surface either. You can actually make some really interesting electronic structures. And here's an example where uh, you've, you take iron atoms on a copper surface and you pull them into what they call an atomic corral. So you take these atoms and you draw them into this nice circular shape. And what you see is at the very center, the ripples of the electron density that add up from all the atoms in the, in the corral to actually form this bump in the very center. And some people call this a pseudo atom. So this actually has atomic properties but there's no atom in the center of that corral. So this is kind of a 2D um, type quantum dot where you're actually confining the electron density inside of that structure. And you can do much more than simply these circles. You can do hexagons, triangles, squared. And if you, if you want additional confinement, you can do a second layer. So in the image of the circle there, there's actually two layers of atoms around the circumference. And you can kind of see that the, that the pseudo atom at the center has a higher amplitude. There's even um, more interesting things you can do. You can actually clone electronic properties. So in this uh, example, there, uh, the corral is, is an ellipse shape. So it has two focal points. And if you know about the optics of, of uh, elliptical mirrors, you know that if you have an object at one point, it will come to focus at the other point. So what they're doing here is they're putting an atom at one of the focal points of the ellipse. And so you can see that in the top image, uh, represented by the colored, the, the colored uh, dots are the atoms themselves. And in the bottom image, you can see the, kind of the height of the electron density. And at the focal point of the ellipse, even though there's no atom there, you get a bump. And that bump appears to be uh, a, like a clone of, of the actual atom at the focal point of the ellipse. So these are really interesting effects that you can see uh, with these things. Uh, just to give you an idea that um, it actually works. If you move the atom out of the focal point, its image would disappear. So in the, in the right-hand side, instead of getting two of those colored bumps, you get just the one. So it's not being cloned per se. So um, this technology is really kind of neat, but as far as um, application goes, this is one of the harder nanotechnologies to bring into the real, the real world. So even though they have direct manipulation of individual atoms, uh, it's a very technically challenging problem. Of course, the instrument has to be very stable. If you look at some of the instruments over at NINT, NINT's foundation is actually an anti-vibration foundation because something as mundane as someone walking by your lab can cause a fluctuation in the, in the atomic tip of the STM that would um, change what you actually see when you're generating an image or actually change the position of an atom if you're manipulating it. Uh, they typically happen at very low temperatures. Uh, in, in these cases, they were done only a few degrees above absolute zero. So you're looking at liquid helium as the cooling source. 
And you're very constrained as far as your materials are concerned. You can't do this on any arbitrary surface. Um, it's not going to work on something like, like wood, right? You need a highly regular surface, like a silicon surface or a copper surface, that you can actually clean down until it's one single monolayer. And that's really amazing when you consider you know, something as flat as a single layer of silicon. Um, it's error prone, like I said, and it scales poorly. So even after 20 years of research, we're still at the point where this stuff is mostly done in the lab. Although, just to give you an example, when I was an undergraduate here, one of my, uh, one of my labs was using a tabletop STM to image a carbon surface. And it was done at room temperature, in air, with a tungsten filament that I literally pulled myself. So it's kind of a statistical thing. Sometimes if you pull it, you get an atomic sharp tip. So you try it out, you put it in. If you can make a nice image, you've got a good tip. If it makes a garbage image, you've got a bad tip, so you pull it again. And so you're just pulling, rather than doing what, what I showed you last Tuesday, where you actually form the tip to a single atom, you're just hoping that if you pull it just the right way, you'll end up with a single tip at the, t at the front anyway. So it is, it's coming down. Um, undergrads these days are playing around with that kind of tabletop STM, but they're not doing the kind of things where you're writing onto the surface. One of the other topics that we covered, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, was patterning electronic states with these STMs. So on the left-hand side there, there's a, an image of the crystalline silicon surface, uh, silicon in yellow, and those white balls representing hydrogen. And this is, I think, the 100 surface. So you get these things that are called dimer rows. So each of those rows is, uh, is part of that crystalline structure that points down into the bulk of the silicon. And again, what you can do with this is you can bring the STM tip close and apply a voltage uh, right above a single hydrogen atom, and it'll actually tear that atom out. And you can, you can write on the surface in this way. So you can go in, you can pluck off hydrogens where you want, and you leave behind that electron orbital called the dangling bond. And you can do it in a very regular way. So in this image, you can see that there has been a, a pattern uh, drawn across several dimer rows like this. And you can actually leak in other things, like polystyrene, that can go and connect to those dangling bonds. So it will preferentially go there, since there's an absence of an atom, and lock onto the surface with a chemical bond. So you can grow things like polystyrene chains across the surface, um, or you can add metals or other molecules to, to go to these sites. But the most interesting thing about these is that the those bonds on the surface actually interact with one another. And that's where we get into um, this quantum cellular automata that we talked a little bit about. So when you've got four dangling bonds next to one another, uh, you get kind of the, an electron distribution that looks like that little quartet there. And the interesting thing is that if you add nearby electrons, you can change the distribution on the surface. So if we add diagonal green electrons, you can see that the red sites have grown in electronic density and the blue sites have shrunk. And this looks a little bit like this when you image it in an STM. And what's interesting about this is since they interact, you can do things uh, like this cellular automata. So just to give you an idea, we didn't go into too much detail of what cellular automata is, but uh, a really good example is Conway's Game of Life. So this is a simulation done on a 2D grid where you have alive cells and dead cells represented by um, white being dead and black being alive. And each iteration of the simulation, each cell looks at its nearest neighbors, counts up how many are alive and, and how many are dead, and then decides whether in the next iteration it's going to be alive or dead. And just doing that very simple rule, I think this is the 3-4 rule for Conway's Game of Life, or 3-3-4, I can't remember um, the exact notation that they use. You can build these interesting structures. This one is a generator that goes along in a linear chain and drops off these, uh, uh, these chain spawners. So you can see, as this thing is moving along, it's creating these little structures that make these long, nice changes. So there's actually a really rich kind of history of what Conway's Game of Life does. And you can do all sorts of really interesting stuff with it. And, the, and so the reason this is so exciting is because these 
quartets that we've talked about of electron orbitals actually behave in a similar way. So if you put two quartets beside each other, they'll tend to line up to reduce electron interactions. And you can do some really interesting things. So you can create these quantum wires where um, they all line up to represent one state. And if you have a big charge on one end, it will flip the state and propagate down the chain. Uh, here's some examples of um, inverters and digital logic that you can actually create. So you can do as much with this quantum cellular automata as you can do with regular logic. But it's hampered, again, because it's done at low temperature and, and very high purities. So this, unfortunately, is one of the movies that did work. And I wish that it, this one had failed and the other ones had worked. But I'll just uh, play this again to um, give you an idea. So here's our electrons. There's our quartet, those four dangling bonds being represented by the four seats. And when there's electron density on it, they tend to sit diagonal to each other. And if one moves, then the other one uh, changes place as well. You can continue stacking these quartets in lines, and they'll minimize their energy by all being lined up. When one changes state, the others follow suit, and it propagates down the line. Okay. And if you have a big charge, so if you put electrodes, say, on the silicon surface, and you, and you cause a big charge, you can actually get the distribution to, to change. And this can be represented as a binary state. So by doing this, you can essentially create you know, a little surface computer, and uh, many millions of times smaller than conventional circuits, that has just minuscule power draw in comparison to what our conventional technology is today. So this is one of the things where I consider this technology to not be very mature, but it has some promise uh, for becoming an interesting uh, technology in the future. So let's put aside uh, all the solid state stuff and let's talk a little bit about bi biology. In particular, um, DNA origami and self-assembled structures using DNA. So this is one of the really interesting fields of work right now that's being done. And the way that it works is you, if you've, you take a, a DNA strand with the four base pairs, and you can actually engineer how it will fold itself if it's in a native state in some aqueous solution. So you can actually use a CAD program to design the sequence that you want and the, and the state that it's going to fold itself into. And then you can order these sequences from many different companies and have them uh, and throw them into water and then give them a little shake. And they'll actually self-assemble into these structures. So, to give you some examples, here's uh, a number of structures that uh, were kind of designed and implemented in uh, a nature paper in 2006. So you can see you can do everything from squares and rectangles to shapes like stars and smiley faces. And uh, they actually fold predictably well, as you can see in the, in the images in the bottom rows. And they actually acquire some some greater structure as well. So you can see the rectangular ones will actually form these long linear chains uh, on a larger scale. Uh, the stars and the smiley faces tend to clump up, and uh, the squares themselves tend to change shape with time. But then you can go on and you can do even more interesting things. So you can actually label the DNA at certain locations. And when it folds up, it will form things like words and images. So you can see the little banner at the top that has a, the image of a DNA strand and the word DNA printed out there. Um, North America, the Americas there, you can see uh, fold up very nicely. And you can get these uh, even larger tertiary structures. So with the triangular example there, you can see that they will, um, they will bond to each other on their sides and form these much, much larger structures. So you have the little flower structure there and the, and the tessellation of the triangles. And what's interesting is that they're not simply limited to the two-dimensional things that you see there either. Uh, one of the most interesting implementations is something like this DNA origami lockable box. So you create the size of the box that they snap together, and then you use a little DNA key to close the lid on the box. So you can conceivably put a drug in there or um, some molecules and have it go to a certain location where the DNA lock would then pop out and the drugs could be delivered. So that's 
one possibility as far as applications go um, in this one. And even more interesting is you can actually build on all of these structures. So you can start with very small structures like these long linear chains, and you can use them kind of like you would be using Tinker Toys. So you can have them connect up in different locations, and you can start building these really large structures. So in the bottom right-hand corner, you can kind of see these DNA cage structures. And they, they actually are like a fully three-dimensional structure, although we only have these 2D images of them. But you can imagine putting larger um, things inside of these cages and having them go to, to different locations. So those are some of the interesting ways that you can play with the DNA geometry. Some of the other things you can do are create these artificial membrane channels. So with you know, that engineered sequence of DNA, you can actually have it self-assemble in a cell and then link up with the cell membrane and, and create this artificial pore. And uh, what's really an interesting application of this is the ability for you to do something like DNA se sequencing. So if you had this pore in a cell and you pulled the DNA strand through the pore, you actually get this current that you could measure um, as each uh, base pair of the DNA passed through. And you'd get this little miniaturized sequencing machine that you could do all sorts of uh, really interesting work with. So you know, in that little subheading there, F, you can see a number of these structures all around a single cell. Now, there are some limits. Um, of course, you can make very complex structures with these things using simple ingredients. And you get the benefit that they self-assemble. So you don't have to worry at all about um, making copies of these things. As long as you have the right sequences of DNA, you can use existing bi biological structures to create um, copies of them. And once that linear DNA strand is created, it will fold itself into the structure that you want. Now, of course, they're, uh, they're limited because uh, DNA doesn't have the same vast kind of library that, the protein, that proteins have. Uh, and they're limited to a range of environments. So, you know, the happy and healthy living tissue environments. Um, they don't survive extreme cold or extreme heat and then salinity and all sorts of other factors come in that can um, change the way that they behave. So the next thing we'll talk about is uh, linear motors. And this is the way that um, you know, our muscles work is on the basis of a linear motor. And what we have in our bodies are myosin proteins that will grab on little actin filaments inside of our body and you can see an animation of this here where this um, myosin head is actually kind of pulling and walking along the surface of the actin filament with the input of energy. And uh, what's interesting is this is a one-way uh, one process. So you can't walk backwards along the same chain. And that's why our muscles only work in contraction. And, and so we have to have two opposing sets of muscles to do work um, in our bodies. Uh, other linear motors are uh, proteins like uh, kinesin, which walks, actually walks with little protein feet along uh, a microtubule. So these things take uh, vesicles in the cell and they'll actually walk them down little microtubule channels to the correct locations in the cells. And this, unfortunately, is one of the animations that didn't work, but I can describe what happens in it. So, you see the red circle in the bottom. That's the vesicle. And it's actually connected to one of these kinesin proteins. And it gets pulled along that very faint microtubule line that is shown uh, ever so faintly, I guess, on the, on the screen there. And so you can imagine if you had control over these things, you could build little, uh, little assembly lines that could pull on your products to where you want to to where you'd want to take them. And there's more examples of these linear motors. Um, myosin 5 can walk along actin filaments. So not only can you walk along different biological structures, uh, but you can kind of, you can, you can tailor, or you might be able to tailor you know, what the step sizes are and uh, what environments they can walk through. So this was a, a very, um, 
highly researched area in the early 2000s, they identified that these proteins actually walk in a hand-over-hand -hand motion. So instead of shuffling along a myosin, or, or uh, sorry, a microtubule like this, they actually walk the way that we would with one foot in front of the other. And the way that these are studied um, in more detail is through the use of something called, an opti called optical trapping. So this is where you take something like a little optical bead and you trap it in the focus of a laser beam. And the way that it works is that uh, the laser beam's focus, the, the ball will, or the bead will tend to stay at the focus of this laser beam. So if you move the laser beam a little bit away from the ball, the ball wants to restore the force and move back into the focus of the laser. And if you connect that, like you see there on a kinesin, you can actually see in your equipment when the kinesin is moving along a microtubule because it will change the optical properties of the bead and you'll have to follow along with it. So you can actually watch one of these little proteins as it walks along one of those microtubules. Okay, now we're on to rotary motor. So we did talk a little bit about this. This rotary motor is called ATP uh, synthase and it is responsible for converting adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate. And it actually functions as a rotary motor. So that big structure that you see hanging out of the, um, the phospholipid bilayer is sitting on something like an axle, and it will rotate as it's producing these, uh, these ATP mo molecules um, as a result of having a little hydrogen gradient along there. And the way that we know that these are rotary, that, that these have rotary action is because you can, you can do a little trick where you uh, attach a fluorescent actin f fiber onto the, onto the axle, and you can actually watch as it spins around. So unfortunately, this is one of the other uh, movies that didn't work, but luckily it was so low resolution that all you have to do is imagine that that image is rotated by 120 degrees over and over and over again, and you get an idea of what the animation is like. So this, um, this motor actually has 120 de degree steps, and it will go 120 degrees every time it converts one of those molecules. And uh, you can kind of show that in a little s uh, statistical model where uh, the position is mapped uh, in the top left there. And it's done in discrete, discrete steps. Um, the basis of something like the, fl uh, the flagellar motor in a bacterium op operates on a, a more complicated principle. And it's actually a composite of a bunch of different protein. So um, it's a very complicated system that's been uh, studied quite a bit. And the way that they study this one is by attaching a little fl fluorescent bead onto the flagella that sticks out of the motor protein. So as it gets spun around, you can watch where the fluorescent bead is, and you can kind of calculate, uh, oops, you can kind of calculate uh, where it is as a function of time. Unfortunately, uh, the, the motor moves so quickly that to actually study it, you have to poison the cell to get it to run a little bit more slowly. So, so those are two different types of motors. There's the linear motor and the rotary motor. This next one is kind of a novel um, type motor, and it, uh, the, the bacteria Listeria is, uh, uses this for, for motion, and it's called a poly polymerization motor. So this is akin to you know, throwing something behind you uh, to move forward. And the way that it works, and unfortunately this doesn't have an animation, but all those little bright areas are um, actin filaments that are being generated by the bacteria. And the bacteria actually push off of the actin filaments as they go. So they have like what they call these little comet trails. And you can see what that looks like in this image. So the bacteria will actually cause actin filaments to polymerize behind it. And as a result, it's pushing itself forward on that actin structure, and you can see it's called, a, it's called a Brownian ratchet. And so you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner there, as each new uh, actin monomer is being added, the cell moves a little step forward and a little step forward and a little step forward. And this is how Listeria actually, it kind of, it, with little, it rockets out of the cell and pushes against the cell membrane with this um, to go on to infect other cells. Okay, so applications in nanoengineering. What can you do with these motors? Uh, or, or what can you do in general? Um, 
with those motors, you can actually transport molecules. So you could design yourself a little molecular shuttle that would move along filaments. Let's see here. And you can actually use those designs to design entirely new motors. So you, um, so you could, you know, this one is a three-footed um, motor that uh, can walk along a DNA track. So you can imagine all sorts of different um, non-biological structures that are taking the ideas from biology and applying them. And that gets us to synthetic biology. So this is really the fusion of biology and engineering, where rather than taking existing biological structures and adapting them for yourself, uh, for your own applications. You're looking at natural systems and you're trying to replicate them with synthetic circuits. And uh, the big benefit of this is that you can kind of eliminate the things that you don't want in a cell and only include the things that you do. So you have this improved designability. And there's actually uh, a registry of standard biological parts that's kind of like a repository of, of Lego bits where each little biological element has a description of what it does and how you produce it. And you can make a, uh, you can design kind of a system of these things that would do something uh, that you'd like to do. So one, one example of uh, synthetic biology is engineering uh, the bacteria E. coli to be light sensitive. And you can do, uh, you can take pictures with this thing. So you see there's the nature masthead and uh, an image of the author of that paper. And you can even go so far as to create synthetic organisms. So in, in Gibson et al. in Science, they actually created an artificial chemically synthesized genome uh, that resulted in something that looked like a little bacterium there. So there are many, uh, many applications of this synthetic biology. Um, obviously, one of the big ones is biosensing. So you, engineer some responsiveness to the environment into some organism that exists, and you can use that um, as a sensor. You can produce uh, biomaterials, so um, one big push right now is to synthetically create things like ethanol and engineer organisms that would do that. Um, pharmaceuticals is another big industry in that area. Cellular digital computation is one. Uh, synthetic pathways or systems to, to test disease mechanisms and therapies. And we'll get onto this a little later on of, of how exactly that works. Uh, you could also engineer viruses as therapeutic agents to target resistant pathogens or increase antibiotic efficiency. And you could treat cancer by um, invading tub or by creating tumor invading bacteria that might deliver drugs to a certain location. And then, of course, you can do things like modifications of disease vectors, so uh, engineering a method of creating flightless female mosquitoes. Now, the trick here is that um, we now kind of have an understanding of what the genome is. So a quote there is that the genome, we bought the book, it's very hard to read. And on the other hand, on the synthesis side of things, we can write in DNA, but we currently have little to say. And uh, we kind of switch gears here to what Michael Woodside actually researches. And uh, he takes um, these optical traps, actually a pair of optical traps, and uses it to uh, apply a mechanical force to single molecules, single biomolecules, like a protein or a piece of DNA. And you can pull these things around and stretch them and apply forces and, and change their length. Uh, and it works kind of like how you'd imagine uh, the tractor beam in Star Trek, only instead of having the force to move an entire spaceship, you're really working on things that are you know, uh, very, very tiny. So I'm gonna show you one application of these um, optical traps, but this is where I have to switch gears and show you the video because I really want you to see this. This is absolutely amazing to see. In this video, you can see there's that black dot that's being moved around. What that is, is it's a single bacteria that's stuck in one of these optical traps that they're physically manipulating in, in three dimensions. So um, they're moving now in the Z plane, so they're moving it up and down in focus. And before that, they were dragging it around in the X and the Y plane. 
So you can imagine moving things on a molecular scale to where you want them, or, or, or classifying bacteria one at a time by using optical traps to actually pick them up and move them into a corral. Uh, and at the very end there, I don't know if you saw that, uh, they let the optical trap go, and the bacterium just swims happily away. So unfortunately, that's the best it's going to get for that. So one of the really big benefits of having those optical tweezers is that you can study things that are extremely difficult to study. And one of the things that uh, Michael Wood Woodside is studying is protein misfolding and what causes it. So one good example of protein misfolding is the prion disease called uh, mad cow disease, Scarpi, or in humans, Critchfeld-Jacobs disease. And it's caused by a prion, a prion protein called PRP that misfolds into some infect infectious structure. We know the, the native structure, but unfortunately the, the infe infectious structure is unknown. And kind of the really strange thing about the infectious structure is that it, it acts on non-infectious proteins and causes them to be infectious as well. So as soon as you have one of these, there's a chance that it could create a second one out of a regular protein and it would just snowball from there. And what happens in, in things like brain tissue is you get these, um, these vacancies where all the proteins have been used up and you get uh, these dense regions where they've all been collected. So you can kind of see the vacuole there is uh, kind of the absence of that region and the amyloid is where they've all kind of clumped together. And there's critical questions uh, regarding this disease. So what is the infectious structure and how does it form? How does it convert native molecules into infectious ones? And how does that end up killing the neurons? So one way of deducing this is by stringing that native protein up between two of these optical traps using little DNA handles to hold on to the protein and actually pulling those apart. So causing a stretching and seeing at which extension you can see at about 550 nanometers that PRP protein unfolds, okay? And you can see exactly how much force it takes and, uh, and what the length difference is when you do that. And then what you do is you relax those optical traps and you allow that protein to fold back up into its native state again. And you can see there's a little bit of hysteresis. So going one direction, then coming back the other, there's that area in the middle that, uh, that the cycle goes around. And it's actually a really interesting technique because it, uh, accurately predicts the length of the, of the unfolded state as the 34.3 nanometers. And, um, and so that's, that's just the start. So that's just the start. You're, you're using these optical tweezers to actually put a force on something and measuring how much uh, it changes as a function of length. So another thing to do is you, you, you hold the optical trap at a constant distance or a constant force in this case and you just wait and see what happens from the molecular motion. So you remember that one of the things we talked about uh, was all these statistical fluctuations that are happening at the nanoscale. So what this, what this allows you to do is calculate just how much force it takes for one of those little protein folding states to occur. So you get this little distribution of unfolded and native states, and at different forces you can kind of see how different structures within the protein are folding up. And what, uh, what Woodside's group has been able to do is identify three ways that this PRP protein can misfold. So you have these off-pathway intermediate unstable um, states, and, and at, so, so the idea is that if you have one of these natively folded states, to get to one of these misfolded states, you have to have a little bit of unfolding, right? So all that statistical fluctuation allows the protein at some point to jump into uh, one of the misfolded states. So one of the ways that you can use this information is by introducing molecules uh, into these simulations and seeing if that molecule interferes with the folding process. So here's an example of uh, an antiprion agent, which unfortunately is not a good drug, but uh, does kind of show you just how the introduction of a, of a new molecular agent changes the way that 
these proteins fold up. So you can see that when this molecule is present, you're on the red curve. And so there's a very high force required to unfold the native state. So you can actually hold all the native proteins in their native states by introducing this molecule. But unfortunately, the molecule is not a good drug. However, now that you know the structure of the molecule that, that interferes with this folding process, you're on the path to designing a new, a new drug that uh, has higher reliability in, in human studies. So that allows you to investigate the me mechanism of anti-prion action. OK, studying, oops, you're still there. OK. Some of these methods also allow you to, do, to actually study the mechanisms of, uh, of a phenomenon called frame shifting. So this is a really interesting, uh, this is a really interesting subject because frame shifting, basically when you're, when you're transcoding DNA from its native, from native DNA to messenger RNA to a protein, you're reading this code three, um, three codons at a time. So in DNA, you've got the, the words are one of these codons. And the interesting thing is that you need to know where one of those codons starts. Because if you don't, you have this error where the ribosome may start one codon off. And it's reading the words one, one letter different than it would normally be. So you get all these interesting, or you get these different structures. So in messenger RNA, um, a, a reading frame is established by a specific first codon, OK? And if it reads it in that way, you get a protein sequence out of a ribosome. If you frame shift it by one, you can see there that you get an entirely different linear chain of amino acids, resulting in an entirely different protein. And if you frame shift it again by two, it'll result in yet another one. And what's really interesting and really kind of cool about this is that viruses, many viruses use this to deliberately encode more than one protein. So they've evolved the ability to basically, or they've, they've found the correct sequence that allows them to produce two or three useful proteins just by frame shifting. The question is, how exactly do they do that? And and how do they control the proportion of which protein? Because you don't just want 50-50. Sometimes you want you know, 20% of protein 1, 80% of protein 2, or vice versa. And the way that they do it is by using something called like a little a slip site. So this is, this, allows, this is something that a ribosome would see as a slippery location on the messenger RNA. And it could actually slip and, and frame shift reading the messenger RNA out. And the thing that controls uh, the proportion of those two proteins is called a frame-shifting pseudonaut. So there's this structure that hangs out at the end that allows the frame-shifting to happen at the different proportions that something like the virus might want. So the question is, how do these pseudonauts help set the level of frame-shifting? And uh, so that's a, an interesting question. And some people argue that it's uh, based on the structure. Um, and so here you can see there's, here are different pseudonauts from different organisms simulating different frame shifting levels. So you can see that given a particular structure in the pseudonaut, you get anywhere from 2% of one protein up to 28% of a different one. And so when I said that you think it might be something to do with unfolding. Actually, the average unfolding force for the native structure doesn't have a correlation with the frame shifting efficiency. So even though, uh, even though you can actually measure what the unfolding force is, that doesn't predict how the final ratio of frame shifted proteins would be. And what it actually ends up to be is, is uh, how often the PRFs are likely to fold into one of these alternate structures. So this is the perfect example of using those optical tweezers to unfold and fold a protein. And you can see intermediate states. So with these PRFs, you can actually um, see there's a correlation between uh, alternatively folded states of the pseudonaut and the frame shifting efficiency. So here's a, another example of um, fighting the SARS virus using uh, 
a molecule here that abolishes frame shifting in the SARS virus. So you're essentially inserting this molecule into the system in which the SARS virus is working, and it stops the SARS virus from, uh, from being able to synthesize that second protein through the frame shifting process. And so you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, that alternative structure is reduced when you add this particular molecule. But again, unfortunately, this molecule is not, uh, not a drug in the sense that you could just give it to somebody. Um, it would probably do more harm than good, but it's one of the beginning points where you can identify a structure that interferes with that process and then engineer a drug uh, from there. So you can see uh, as you go that, that the ligand, that that molecule there will uh, alternate the structure when it's bound to it. So that, that basically covers kind of the, the applications in synthetic biology and in uh, condensed matter physics uh, that Michael wanted to talk about. But just before we end the talk today, let's talk a little bit about the safety of these nanotechnological systems. So gray goo is not the kind of thing that we need to be worrying about. Um, Self-replicating organisms are a potential worry in synthetic biology, but in general, when we talk about biology, we're already talking about self-replicating systems. So we're not likely to be introducing things that have a better ability to reproduce than what already exists in the world. So you know, if you could you could talk a little bit about engineered viruses, and I I don't know if that's going to be a topic when you talk about um, what's the Yeah, it might come up in Jack Dzinski's, but there's the... Anyway, I'll, I'll skip that for now. Um, but one of the things that is a problem is quantifying the nanotoxicology of a substance. So we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about quantum dots. And as it turns out, if you have a substance um, like these zinc oxide nanoparticles, the toxicity of the system doesn't just depend on the material that it's made out of, but also the size and even the shape that those nanoparticles are in. So the zinc nanoparticles that uh, are seen here are often used in sunscreens. And if you change the size of them, if you make them smaller, they end up getting more and more toxic as a function of their decreasing size. Um, and then, of course, the shape of something can have uh, toxicity effects as well. So when we're making carbon nanotubes, uh, Inhaling those can have the same effects as inhaling things like asbestos fibers, causing asbestosis. And it's also known that nanoparticles can denature proteins. So as a function of gold nanoparticle diameter, you can see there's the association constant of different proteins in there. And as the gold nanoparticle size decreases, so does the association constant. Um, Nanoparticles can also modulate lipid, lipid membrane structure and actually change how uh, molecules move through cellular walls. And they've been known to cause pregnancy complications in mice. And there's all sorts of associated effects that, um, that nanoparticle exposure can cause in the human body itself. So right now, we're kind of at the beginning of of this um, quantification of, of the toxicology. So there are important questions that are still unclear, like um, how do you quantify a, a dosage of nanoparticles? Do you do it by mass? Do you do it by surface area? And really, how do you evaluate the toxicity? Because as a metabolic process, you might be shrinking the size of the quantum dot and it increasing their effectiveness. Um, how do the properties change with time? Not only can they degrade in the body, but they can also aggregate. So instead of having this nice distribution that you'd normally have, they can form these bigger clumps that have different properties. Uh, what ultimately ends up in the life cycle? If we're talking about things like heavy metal nanoparticles, like cadmium selenide, if you're using those for imaging, how ultimately do those get excreted from the body? Where ultimately do they go in the environment? And where do they accumulate uh, in the end? What level of exposure uh, from different environments? So hmm, that's a strange phrase. I'll skip that one. 
And is any aspect of toxicology predictable from bulk materials? And as we know, the properties get vastly different depending on shape and size. The critical question here is, can it be modeled? So, you know, when we talk about shapes, if you have a certain amount of material, you can imagine that the configuration space for all the different shapes it can take is, is just massive. Uh, so could you predict the toxicology of a particular shape simply by simulating it in a computer? And basically, if you look at the literature as of last year, nanospecific cytotoxicology of silica nanoparticles, so this is very related to what I study, but um, silica is silicon dioxide, so it's got two oxygens per silicon. Um, even something as inert as silica has effects of aggregation and contradictory evidence about the size dependence of its toxicity. So even something that you'd assume is non-toxic because it doesn't contain something like a heavy metal can have uh, toxicity problems when they're nanocrystalline, when they're actually small enough, uh, when they're small. Uh, and different toxicity in different cell types, it's unclear why. And there's many parameters that just aren't sufficiently explored. So today, one of the big pushes is to have uniform practices and standards for comparative testing. And this is one of the issues that crops up again and again when you're talking about nano silver that's used as antimicrobial coatings for things like clothes. So should that be seeking FDA approval or what other regula regulatory agencies need to be involved in producing materials like that? So the, the risks must be framed appropriately at this point. And uh, as you can see in this image, hikers and bikers move to the side of the road when a vehicle approaches. Are we introducing new, new dangers uh, by not having standards right now, or will we, will we be hampering the progress of science by introducing standards that may be too strong uh, in research today? So we'll just acknowledge some of the material that was in this lecture, and I'll take time for some questions. So, any questions? I guess... Uh, Nanotech, one striking thing about it is there is no regulatory body, there are no rules about what to do with it yet. And in many settings, it's so highly specialized that whatever you're doing is a kind of one-off that you've prepared for months for that particular moment at near absolute zero and so on. But aren't we, we, we're approaching a time when uh, very important things for human society will be done with uh, nanotech and where uh, regulation will be required. So what are, what are your thoughts about that? To give maybe an example to illustrate that, it, my own research, so we, we make silicon quantum dots and as far as the university is concerned, silicon is you know, the stuff that computer chips are made out of. So they, they don't seem to be worried about the size of the particles that we're making. And that's simply because the procedures that we're using are the same procedures that we use when we handle any dangerous chemical. So we're not actually like taking this quantum dot powder and touching it with our fingertips or anything like this the way that we make it is actually probably more dangerous than the substance it itself. So um, if you're familiar with a, a molecule called hydrogen fluoride, you'll know it's an, an acid that is very um, damaging to the nervous system. So that's one of the molecules that we use to actually create the quantum dots. We store them in a solvent called toluene, and uh, that's one of the things that you don't want to have a great amount of exposure to. So we're always wearing gloves when we do these things. And I think in general, if you're doing that type of research on the materials themselves and not on like the toxicity of those materials, you're aware that the properties of their interaction with, with you and with the environment are unknown. So for the most part, we try and keep the particles and, and us separated. Um, 
more and more every day there's more studies coming about, about the different toxicities of nanoparticles and nanoparticle sizes um, and their effects in different organisms. And I think at, at some point, but maybe not right away, there is going to be a push um, to, to form a, regulation, a, a regulating agency that actually uh, lays down some rules on how you do this. And I think as far as consumer protection is concerned, that it might be a push from the com consumer protection side of things because there are products today that advertise being nanotechnological. Um, but then again, at the same time, uh, how do you distinguish a nanoparticle from uh, a pre-existing material in, that just exists in nature and the toxicity effects from that? So th there are a lot of unknowns, and I think just standard kind of chemical regulations, for the most part, do a good job of protecting people from, from the existing uh, perils. So a, a lot of the fears that the general public has come from Michael Crichton's book, Prey, um, do, we're nowhere close to having anything that, that is similar to any of the threats in that book, right? I mean, it, 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 it's completely fictional, just as fictional now as it was when it was written, as far as I know. We, we don't seem to be, uh, you know, progressing toward those uh, dangers being real. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to the top-down and bottom-up approach. Like, there's a big gap on, on the bottom end of the top-down approach and on the top end of the bottom-up approach mm -hmm. that, that needs to be met, right? We're all in molecular chemistry down here and synthetic biology and all up in here. We're, uh, you know, doing microelectrical mechanical devices and getting down to, you know, single molecule um, circuits. But on the bottom end, that's basically all done at room temperature in biological environments. And at the top end, it's all done at low temperature and high vacuum. So the gap is not small in terms of the size of things that we're manipulating, but the gap is large in terms of the environments in which we can do these things. So making stable things that work in air is a big problem. Making stable circuits that work at high temperatures is a problem. And, and the gap is shrinking every day, but the gap still is, is a, a fairly large gap. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, I don't think we're going to be seeing these like nanobots that everybody purports, um, but we will start seeing passive technologies like the pill cameras that you can swallow, getting smaller and smaller, maybe to the point where they no longer are impeded by um, the, the diameter of a capillary or something like that. So, it's a good question, and uh, you know, I don't know if there's a, a good way of predicting when we'll see technology like. Yeah, around 15 years ago, there was an int interest in the idea of uh, smart paints that, you know, there's tremendous willingness of the general public to spend money keeping up with the Joneses if their na neighbors have something. And if your neighbor has furniture and walls that can instantly change color and patterns to the most beautiful things you can possibly imagine, then everybody would want that. But it turns out, I think, that that's incredibly difficult um, to have very small particles know where they are in relationship to other particles is what you would need there. That each of those particles would kind of have, a, have to have a general concept of the wall or the picture that, that is being made. And as far as we know, that, that's just absolutely uh, impossible at the moment. Is that how you see it. So I think we're no closer to this smart paint that every consumer would have and everybody would pay big bucks for than, than we were when I was talking about it um, 15 years ago. Yeah, I think the most compelling argument to support that idea, you're, you're right about that, is um, the example that we gave last lecture on those uh, little cube bots that formed the little stick man template. Mm -hmm. Like, those are getting smaller every year, but they're still, you know, a minimum of a centimeter across. Mm -hmm. And for something like smart paint to work in the way that you've described it, it's got to be millimeters and less across. You wouldn't want to see kind of an individual um, You wouldn't pixel. want pixelated walls. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so when, you, when you're talking about that kind of distributed structure, it's actually good to kind of think about what is the current technology that we use today that, that is based on that l large scale structure but very finely crafted elements. And you know, you glance at your nearest computer screen or, mm -hmm. uh, or cell phone, and you can see, you know, th there's a question, why don't we have 50 inch 4K displays? Why don't we have giant TVs made of like insanely dense pixel, pixels? And it's, it's a reliability issue. Again, if you had um, one in a million pixels dead, Mm -hmm. then in a single megapixel image, one of the pixels is going to be glowing red or glowing green mm -hmm. or dark completely. So we were getting better at building those structures, but you know, the, the whole dream of, of doing it so quickly that uh, you know, in 10 years we're going to have uh, paint, paint on TVs that you could just mm -hmm. like, paint across the wall and it, and, and it can change colors like your current television does. Yeah. So we're still at the point where... where we're limited by errors as far as the size of our devices and the complexity of them is. Right. I think there's an interesting way that your processors are, are selected for your computers. There's a, um, at least Intel does a process called binning where they, um, they'll generate just you know, thousands of copies of a processor and then they'll test them at the nominal voltage that they want to run it at. And some of the processors run at 2.3 gigahertz, and they put it in the 2.3 gigahertz bin. And some of them work at 2.1, and they put it in the 2.1. <laughs> so there's even a statistical distribution yeah. as far as like what we consider pristine engineering. Yeah. These devices are not operating at the speeds that, that uh, they're not operating in a very narrow range of speeds. They've got a distribution of them. And so <laughs> rather than uh, throw out the ones that are low speed, they get sold at a lower price. Huh. Fascinating. So, questions, you guys? You know, what might happen, Ross, is this could be a teaching session that's a bit shorter than any others. Actually, that'd be, you know, convenient for me and probably for you and probably for them. So, why don't we do that, let people out. out. This is the earliest we've ever let people out, I think 304. In three years, we've never done it that quick. But anyway, thank, thank you very much for an outstanding session.